Hello, this is John Bauden, historian at Oregon State University. In this lecture, I'm going to provide an overview of the American Prohibition Movement, the motivations of its proponents, their tactics, and stunning legislative triumph in 1919. This period of history illustrates the power of grassroots activism combined with an organized effective lobbying arm that imposed its moral vision on the United States. In 1850, the legal position of American women bears mentioning. Married women could not own property in their own names or engage in litigation independently. Women could not vote, serve on juries, or hold public office. Women who worked outside of the home had limited opportunities to earn a living wage, and some American women were enslaved persons without legal autonomy of any kind. I mention all of this because a married woman who had an alcoholic husband was in a perilous situation. American reformers such as Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Sojourner Truth shared three strong political convictions during the 19th century. Abolitionism, voting rights for women, and temperance. On the last point, they could all see how excessive whiskey consumption led to domestic violence and other social ills that disproportionately affected women and children. In my previous lecture, I mentioned the 18th century gin craze that occurred in Great Britain. Gin was cheap and highly intoxicating. As a result, Britain's parliament wanted to limit its consumption through excise taxes. In the United States, Dr. Benjamin Rush described the clinical effects of excessive consumption of distilled spirits in 1784 and recommended that the consumption of hard liquor be replaced by the moderate use of beer, cider, or wine. 19th century social reformers began calling for moderate drinking or temperance, if not a total ban on alcohol. These reformers also targeted saloons as the primary cause of domestic violence and impoverished families. In 1826, the American Temperance Society, founded in Boston, declared its aim to suppress the too free use of ardent spirits. In 1836, the American Temperance Union declared its goal of total abstinence or teetotalism. The Washington Temperance Society had its members pledge never to drink again. The Washingtonians, as they were called, resemble Alcoholics Anonymous in our time. Like abolition and women's suffrage, temperance was a mid-century reform movement with grassroots energy, passion, and moralism. We're right, we'll fight, and we won't compromise. Another landmark in the history of the Prohibition Movement came in 1851 when Maine passed a law that prohibited the sale of alcoholic beverages except for medicinal, mechanical, or manufacturing purposes. According to Portland Mayor Neil Dow, the law was an attempt to, quote, validate American family values, end quote, in much the same way as other laws prohibited adultery, dueling, and lotteries elsewhere in the United States at this time. By 1855, 12 states had passed prohibition laws. And what's noteworthy is that it's the northeastern states, New York, Massachusetts, Vermont, Rhode Island. This is where you had the most organized temperance societies and prohibition laws. The rural south was mostly wet, while the western frontier was mixed. That said, Maine's first-in-the-nation prohibition law was difficult to enforce. One tavern owner in Portland charged customers a nickel to see his striped pig. And for each viewing of the pig behind his tavern, spectators were rewarded with a free glass of beer. And as you might guess, there were multiple viewings of the pig. Other taverns soon featured similar promotions and workarounds. So there was resistance. Even though dry laws existed across the Northeast, many communities simply refused to arrest individuals who sold beer and whiskey. Dry states could do nothing to prevent the transport of alcoholic beverages into their states from wet ones like Pennsylvania. Then the Civil War uh, refocused national priorities. The agitation for prohibition was put on hold from 1861 to 1865. During Reconstruction in the South and industrial growth in the North, temperance was not the hot-button issue it had been in the 1840s and 1850s, but it resurfaced, 
and with new organizational strength in the mid-1870s. The Women's Christian Temperance Union, founded in Ohio in 1874, and despite its name, it advocated a total ban on the manufacture and sale of alcoholic beverages. It wasn't about temperance or moderation. It appealed to Protestant middle-class women with the means and the energy for social activism. It targeted saloons as the source of all evil, saloons as an assault on the American family and the creator of drunk, abusive husbands incapable of providing for their families. The League gained a large following outside of the big cities. WCTU members included millions of Protestant church-going women, and one of their main tactics was to stand outside of saloons, sing hymns, and pray that the men inside would reform themselves and stop drinking. They campaigned to have all saloons closed, using a mixture of moral argument and direct confrontational action. WCTU President Francis Willer, pictured left, led the organization from 1879 to 1898 and recharged the drive to prohibition. The organization supplied textbooks to schools that purported to show how alcohol harmed the human body, and crucially, they successfully pushed for high license laws and local option laws. Local option laws allowed counties to regulate liquor by refusing to grant liquor licenses to businesses or prevent public sale of alcoholic beverages. The laws could not prevent individuals from receiving or consuming alcoholic beverages, but the dry laws demonstrated the WTCU's successful action at the state and local level. They were preparing the way for a nationwide prohibition. Between 1883 and 1887, most of the counties in Maryland and West Virginia adopted such no license provisions and Georgia, Mississippi, and Missouri passed local option laws. During the same period, Kansas, Rhode Island, Iowa, and Dakota Territory all voted for statewide prohibition. The movement was growing. And in states like Missouri and Wisconsin, where the dries uh, could not always impose what they wanted, they might focus on passing high license laws, which required tavern owners to pay $500 or $1,000 annually to operate. This forced the average saloon keeper out of business, and it forced the breweries to purchase ownership of hundreds of saloons. The prohibitionists, by turning their attack on the saloons, linked beer, a mildly intoxicating drink, indiscriminately with wine, whiskey, and vice. Now I want to mention an interesting figure from the period. Cherry Nation, pictured here in 1890, was a colorful, infamous Prohibition movement figure from Kansas. She was an imposing woman, six feet tall, who dressed in all black and brandished a hatchet. Though Kansas was a dry state, the law wasn't always being enforced, and between 1900 and 1910, Nation was arrested 30 times for violent conduct and criminal damage. She would pray outside of a saloon, read her Bible, and then come into the saloon and hack it up with her hatchet. And saying loudly to everyone in the saloon, I gave you your chance. She would then pay her criminal fines with fees from lectures and sales of souvenir hatchets. In her own words, she was, quote, a bulldog running along the feet of Jesus, barking at what he doesn't like, end quote. So Nation symbolizes the Prohibition Movement's militancy and its commitment, its passion. The Anti-Saloon League, founded in Ohio in 1893, had as its goal to eliminate completely the liquor traffic in America, and it developed an effective nationwide coalition to accomplish that goal. The ASL favored careful politics over prayers and stunts. Its state chapters focused on how politicians voted rather than whether they personally drank. It 
The organization supported dry candidates of either political party, the Republicans or the Democrats, and pressured those who wavered and succeeded in making prohibition a vote-winning issue. The Anti-Saloon League, unsurprisingly, targeted saloons. And that was smart because many Americans viewed the saloon as a social ill. The ASL had public relations campaigns, however false or misleading, that demonized alcohol, suggesting that one drop of booze was enough to create an addict. And it's the organization is significant for its black and white vision of politics and its stunning success over a 25-year period. They really had a point of view that can be summed up with you're either against the saloon or you're for broken families, impoverished children, and battered wives. It's one or the other. They turned prohibition into a wedge issue. The Anti-Saloon League made effective use of emotional propaganda and misinformation. The League was comfortable playing fast and loose with the facts and pulling on people's heartstrings. The group had catchy slogans like, lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours. That was one. Which gets your vote, mother or the saloon? Vote dry. That was another. Temperance societies launched misinformation campaigns. Brewers were alleged to adulterate their beer. They made false accusations of acid found in beer uh, and supposed defects and insanity caused by spurious beer. Wayne B. Wheeler was the primary spokesman for the Anti-Saloon League, and he was an exceptionally effective lobbyist. He helped defeat state politicians unwilling to vote for prohibition or local option laws. He had a gift for organization, rhetoric, and a keen understanding of what it would take to achieve prohibition. Namely, it would take a nationwide movement of voters. By 1905, most states had local option laws, if not statewide prohibition, and Wayne B. Wheeler was feeling ever more confident. I should also mention that his efforts dovetailed with the progressive era in American history. Progressives wanted to improve society. They championed universal suffrage, prohibition, and workplace protections. Temperance societies and progress progressives alike saw the need for more governmental control and involvement in citizens' lives. The beer industry defended itself. It advertised the inspections conducted by the Federal Pure Food and Drug Act. The Pennsylvania State Brewers Association tried to swat away anti-saloon league propaganda with well-reasoned explanations of why moderate beer consumption was not a cause of crime. But it was hard. It was difficult uh, to compete with anti-saloon league publications. After all, alcohol is one major cause of social problems. The 16th Amendment to the United States Constitution, another progressive idea, was ratified in 1916, and it is highly significant because now the federal government had a new way of raising revenue other than federal excise taxes on beer and whiskey. It's not a coincidence that the Anti-Saloon League launched its final campaign for nationwide prohibition the same year. And they did so after a solemn march up to the Capitol steps with their proposal to amend the U.S. Constitution. I want to read a statement by William Schold, president of the California State Brewers Association in 1914. Quote, Prohibition is contrary to sound political principles. The best government is that which most liberally lets citizens along, constraining them in no way inconsistent with common sense ideas of freedom. Prohibition in Maine, Kansas, Georgia, and other states has been a total failure and a farce. Wherever it is enacted, otherwise law-abiding persons establish kitchen breweries, wine presses, and moonshine distilleries. It breeds dishonesty and hypocrisy among its advocates, end quote. Ten years later, Schuld's words would be quite prescient. But it was 1914, and at this time it was very unclear what would happen. 
Over the next few years, the movement towards a constitutional amendment banning the sale and manufacture of alcohol ramped up. Both sides understood the seriousness of the moment. Uh, brewery workers organized against the idea of nationwide prohibition. And although women had led the temperance movement for decades, it did not encompass all American women, and especially not in the cities where large numbers of European immigrants lived. Some, if not a majority, of American women believed prohibition was an assault on personal liberty and personal choice. The Anti-Saloon League played hardball with state and national politicians. Wayne Wheeler offered the political class a choice. Vote for prohibition or we'll come after you in the next election cycle. In this respect, the uh, Anti-Saloon League was a very modern lobby. In, in fact, the first modern lobby. It made campaign donations to dry politicians and threatened to unseat politicians who voted wet. Two of the wealthiest men in America, John D. Rockefeller and Henry Ford, contributed generously to the cause of passing the 18th Amendment. They reasoned that a dry America would be a more industrious and a more industrious America and less likely to miss work. Productivity would go up. Brewers saw the writing on the wall uh, and began to explore other production options in the event of prohibition, such as malt drinks and tonics. Some breweries saw the potential to specialize in ice production or dairy products. Well, then something big happened. After German submarines sank the USS Lusitania, the United States entered World War I on the side of France and Great Britain. Overnight, there was a wave of anti-German sentiment and hostility to the German-American brewing industry. It was, in fact, controlled primarily by German-Americans. Millions of American men were mobilized for the war against the German Empire at, at the end of 1917, and prohibitionists understood that the circumstances were ideal for a final push. Who could justify beer or whiskey production amid wartime mobilizations and the rationing of grain? In August 1917, the U.S. Senate voted 65 to 20 for a resolution calling for the passage of the 18th Amendment to the United States Constitution that would ban the sale and manufacture of alcohol. In December 1917, the U.S. House voted 282 to 138 for the same resolution. Ratification campaigns began statewide in 1918. Now all that remained was three-fourths of the state's to vote for ratification of this amendment. Proponents of the 18th Amendment painted the brewing industry as anti-American, as Huns loyal to Germany instead of the United States. You see here in this cartoon, lager uber alles, which means lager above all else, above loyalty to the United States. More than 10 states had already enfranchised women in 1917, which meant that millions would have a chance to vote for ratification of the 18th and 19th Amendment, which guaranteed voting rights for women. Here I want to stop and say that it's important to remember just how far the temperance movement had come. Oregon and Washington State, two beer-guzzling states in the 21st century, adopted prohibition, statewide prohibition in 1916. And it was men in Congress who voted overwhelmingly for prohibition, not women. In some, most enfranchised Americans would vote for a nationwide ban on alcohol. The movement had strong public support. The 18th Amendment was the nationwide prohibition on alcohol proposed by the United States Congress in December 1917 and ratified in 1919. On January 8, 1918, Mississippi was the first state to ratify the 18th Amendment. And on January 16, 1919, Nebraska ratified the 18th Amendment, achieving a three-fourths majority of states to amend the United States Constitution. Now comes the Volstead Act. The Volstead Act was enacted by the United States Congress in 1919 to enforce the 18th Amendment. It banned the manufacture and sale of alcoholic drinks, and it went into effect 
January 1920. An interesting thing about the Volstead Act is that American President Woodrow Wilson vetoed the bill, saying in October 1919, quote, These miserable hypocrites in the House and Senate, many with their cellars stocked with liquor and not believing in prohibition at all, jumping at the whip of the lobbyist. The country would be better off with light wines and beers. So he was a, an advocate of temperance, but not um, prohibition. Congress overruled his veto, and prohibition was set then to go into effect at the beginning of 1920. Wrapping up, if we ask why Americans voted for prohibition, the answer is complex and has multiple factors of significance. You know, to begin, alcohol abuse and its related social problems motivated the American temperance movement. Social reformers from the progressive era wanted to improve American society. American women led the movement for decades, showing the strength of their voices. Prohibition exposed a rural-urban divide. It was the rural areas that favored prohibition overwhelmingly, while the cities did not. Puritanical and nativist impulses were at play. Protestants favored prohibition more than Catholics did. Lastly, there was a class divide. Middle class Americans advocated temperance while the working classes wanted a drink. In sum, prohibition was a proxy for many of the country's political divisions, its divides. And in the next lecture, we'll see how the prohibition experiment went. Here are some of the sources I relied on for this lecture. I look forward to your comments and your questions.